Welcome to the Harold B. Lee Library's House of Learning Lecture Series. I'm Mike Hunter, the coordinator for this year's lecture series. In Doctrine and Covenants, section 88, verse 119, it says, Organize yourselves and establish a house, even a house of faith, a house of learning. The Harold B. Lee Library seeks to establish a house of learning through this lecture series by bringing students and scholars together for discussion of ideas. Today we have two featured speakers and we are going to have Marsha Broadway who is the Juvenile Literature Librarian here at the Harold B. Lee Library to introduce those speakers. Marcia. First, on behalf of the University Librarian Julian Butler and the more than 20 librarians, curators, and staff who have worked on the Alexander Project, we welcome you and are pleased to welcome family, friends, and fans of Lloyd Alexander. Um, today, um, we open the Lloyd Alexander Collection in the L. Tom Perry Library, and the exhibit entitled Alexander's Box uh, in the Farnsworth Juvenile Literature Library. We chose this opening date to correspond to the 86th birthday of Lloyd Alexander, which will be Saturday, January 30th. We are delighted to have Lloyd and Janine Alexander's granddaughter, Diana Perillo, with us, along with lifetime family friend, Kami Nix. Immediately following the House of Learning lecture, there will be a question and answer session moderated by the education librarian, Rachel Wadham. Because many in attendance here today have three o'clock commitments, we will end this lecture at 2.50. Uh, the question and answer session will start immediately. From three o'clock to 3.45, the special educa I'm sorry, the special collections will host a um, reception for us. And when you leave the auditorium and go out into the atrium, the first doors to your left will be the doors into special collections. From 3 o'clock until 4.40, tours of the exhibit Alexander's Box will be hosted by the Juvenile Literature Library staff. And that exhibit is located on level four in the library. And if you're not familiar with this building, you may ask anyone that looks as though they're employed here how to get there and they will direct you. <laughs> it is now my pleasure to introduce lifelong friends and fans of Lloyd Alexander, Professors James Jacob and Michael Tunnell. Their association with Lloyd has spanned almost three decades. They also chose to make Alexander and his contributions to American children's literature the focus of their individual dissertations. They jointly wrote the reference book, Lloyd Alexander, a bio-bibliography, and Michael Tunnell is the author of The Prudain Companion. Both Jim and Mike teach children's literature in the McKay School of Education and are known for their engaging teaching styles. Would you please welcome our speakers today? Thank you, Marcia, and welcome, everyone. As the five-book Chronicles of Prydain, Lloyd Alexander's major literary work, come to an end, many of the principal characters depart the world of men for the mythical summer country, a land without strife or suffering. 
says the enchanter Dalbin, I leave with sorrow, but with even greater joy. I am an old man and weary, and for me there shall be rest and a laying down of burdens which have grown all too heavy upon my shoulders. Heavy with his own burdens, including the very recent loss of his wife and the cancer eating away at his body, Lloyd Alexander undertook his own voyage to the summer country on May 17, 2007, leaving behind a legacy of story not to be exceeded in the landscape of American children's fantasy literature. This literary legacy has earned the respect of the academic com community, including, of course, the two of us. Jim Jacobs, my colleague here at the podium, studied Alexander's life and creative process for his doctoral dissertation titled Lloyd Alexander, A Critical Biography. And uh, as you know, my name is Mike Tunnell, and I also wrote a Lloyd Alexander dissertation. It was titled An Analytical Companion to Prydain which examines the many facets of his major work, including its roots in Celtic myth. Both of us became Lloyd's friends, and we visited him often in, at his Drexel Hill, Pennsylvania home, and uh, talked with him regularly on the telephone. That relationship is, at least in part, responsible for our presence here today. In his will, Lloyd left his papers and his possessions related to his writing life to Brigham Young University. Even the contents of his home office, which he affectionately named The Box, are here. And most of it is on permanent display in a newly remodeled room on the library's fourth floor. The university and the Harold B. Lee Library are, as you know, today celebrating the official opening of the Lloyd Alexander exhibit and collection. We were invited to give this House of Learning lecture as a part of this long-anticipated event, and we're pleased to welcome Lloyd's family members and friends, some of whom have traveled great distances to be here to, with us today. Alexander's struggles to become a writer. So who is this man, this writer, Lloyd Alexander? Why has he earned a secure place in the hearts of generations of readers? And why are he and his work deemed worthy of academic study? To understand the answers to these questions, one must understand the two major turning points in Alexander's writing career. The first came at the end of a period of sustained failure. Lloyd Alexander began writing seriously in high school. And though he wrote and submitted many poems and short stories, his only success was winning 29th place in the Writer's Digest Short Story Contest of 1942. His prize was two cents per word, a total of $25, which he immediately spent on books. After high school, he worked for a year as a messenger in a downtown Philadelphia bank to earn money for college. He continued writing during this time, and during his one semester, at Westchester College. But after enlisting in the Army during World War II, the writing stopped. He did not begin again until the war was over, while in Paris as a part of the occupation forces, and while he began studies at the Sorbonne. Returning to his native Pennsylvania with Janine, his French wife, and their daughter Madeline, he continued the work he'd begun in Paris, translating the works of several French writers. Contacts he'd made in France, including Gertrude Stein, led to his being the English translator for Jean-Paul Sartre's Nausea and The Wall and other stories, both released in 1949. He also translated a collection of Paul Euard's poems, as well as Paul Villers, the Sea Rose, both published in 1951. After reading the translation of his poetry, poetry, Eluard offered Alexander the highest of praises, saying, it's as if I'm reading my own poetry all over again. 
However, Alexander did not view translation as a creative process, but rather a mechanical one. During this time after the war, he worked enthusiastically on his own novels for adults. In his most ambitious attempt, his goal was to, quote, cover every aspect of the human condition in Philadelphia's high society, close quote. With a working title of The Beautiful Children, Alexander referred to this project loosely as War and Peace in Philadelphia, freely acknowledging its scope to be at least as broad as Tolstoy's. Funded by a temporary veteran's benefit, he wrote 12 hours a day, seven days a week, for a year with no success. He then took a job and wrote only four hours each day, still 12 hours on Saturdays and Sundays, for six additional years, still without publishing. During these seven years, Alexander completed three manuscripts that remained unsold. Because he had been so disciplined and tried everything he could to succeed, and because writing was the only thing he wanted to do in life, the years of rejection caused him to begin to lose hope. For one who always had been sure of his eventual literary victory, these cracks in his faith were indeed serious. Of this, he said, I had absolutely nothing left, and I was ready to quit. I considered it the way you would contemplate shooting yourself in the head. I don't know if I seriously contemplated that or not, but I was ready to. What saved him, both literally and literarily, was the sudden thought that, and I quote, I realized I had overlooked the only thing I had known anything about, and that was my own adolescence. This insight came, quote, when I had reached rock bottom and didn't know whether to laugh or cry. I began laughing uproariously at myself as the stupid, presumptuous fool. Idiot, you're writing novels of high society. Fool, you haven't even crossed the tracks of the main line. What are you doing? I laughed at myself, and it was very salutary. I think that really saved my sanity. I remembered my first job as a messenger in a bank. What then had seemed catastrophic now struck me as deeply funny. I was able to laugh at it and at myself. Having nothing left, I wrote about it, my fourth and last attempt. He knew this was not going to be one of the world's greatest novels. It was, in fact, a last-ditch effort before a walk off the pier. Alexander was saved from a watery death when the Thomas Y. Kroll Company accepted the manuscript for publication and Let the Credit Go was published in 1955. At last, Alexander had found his stride by turning to autobiographical novels. Additional books about his own life experiences followed. He wrote about his cats, My Five Tigers, 1956. Janine's humorous adjustments to American life, Janine is French, 1959. And the important function music played throughout his life, My Love Affair with Music, 1960. During this time, he also wrote a number of commissioned books, such as two novels for younger readers about Jewish leaders in colonial America, Border Hawk, August Bondi, 1958, and Flagship Hope, Aaron Lopez, 1960. He also was hired to write the story of Louis Camuti, a New York City veterinarian who specialized in treating the cats of high-rise city dwellers, Park Avenue Vet, 1962, as well as a history of the ASPCA, 50 Years in the Doghouse, 1963. With these titles, he was no longer writing about his own life and quickly realized that he had to figuratively cross the main line and discover as much as he could about these subjects. Speaking of 50 Years in the Doghouse, Alexander said, it wasn't good enough for me to take a humorous anecdote about an elephant on the loose and simply retell it. I tried to inform myself about the biology of elephants, to give myself as much background as possible. 
He bought books about animal behavior and animal psychology. He went to encyclopedias and zoological reference books for months before beginning the actual writing. The first turning point in Alexander's writing career then was that epiphany that he should be writing about his own life. And that led to the second turning point. In 1962, he began to formulate the idea that became his first true children's book. He did not count the two commissioned books for the Jewish Publication Society, and also his first fantasy. Quote, I had been writing for adults with great satisfaction and modest success, he said. But at that particular point in my life, for reasons I still don't altogether understand, I felt that I wanted to write a book for children, that whatever I wanted to say could be best said or could only be said in that form. The initial difficulty, unfortunately, was that I hadn't the vaguest notion of what I wanted to say, close quote. Nonetheless, Alexander eventually figured it out, and in 1963, Time Cat was published, a fanciful story of a cat that magically spirits his young master to nine different ancient cultures, the sites of each of his nine lives. With the publication of Time Cat, Alexander's writing life changed forever. He was, from that point on, a children's book author and a writer of fantasy. The research for Time Cat laid the groundwork for his next project for young readers, his most noteworthy work, The Chronicles of Prydain. This five-volume series, beginning with the Book of Three, earned him his first literary prizes, and he started, the top, started at the top with the most prestigious of children's book awards, the John Newberry Medal. The Black Cauldron, the second in the series, received a Newberry Honor Award, and The High King, the last book, won the Newberry Medal outright and established him as a writer of note. From Time Cat forward, he wrote exclusively for young readers, completing 36 books, largely fantasy. The literary world continued to recognize Lloyd with prizes other than the Newberry, such as two National Book Awards for The Marvelous Misadventures of Sebastian and Westmark, and two Boston Globe Hornbook Awards for The Cat Who Wished to Be a Man and The Fortune Tellers. International awards included the Swedish Golden Cat Award, which recognizes lifetime achievement in writing for young readers, and the Norwegian Children's Book Prize for the Town Cats. Lloyd Alexander and his books. The dedication evidenced by Lloyd's early and consistent writing schedule has produced some of the most memorable and insightful prose in the history of modern children's literature. Lloyd nourished in readers a sense of our noble potential as his characters struggle to find within themselves such traits as honor, courage, and compassion. One of the prime examples of this comes in Terran Wanderer, the fourth of the Prydain Chronicles. Terran, the main character, was found as a baby, the only living thing amid the carnage on a battlefield. He has always imagined himself the child of nobility, and when he falls in love with Princess Ilanwi, he decides he must prove the birthright that would allow him to marry her. The course of events in this novel becomes Terran's refining fire, forcing him to choose courage over cowardice, honor over selfishness, and truth over falsehood. The most pivotal moment comes when Terran believes he has found his father, not a noble prince, but a lowly shepherd named Craddock. He is savaged by his bitter disappointment and consumed by his seething self-pity. Terran abandons the life he hoped for to live alone with his crippled father. Then as winter grips the rough hill country, Craddock falls into an icy crevice and is grievously wounded. To rescue him from the bottom of the pit is virtually impossible. Realizing this, Terran feels a terrible surge of relief at the prospect of freedom. 
but anguish floods in to drown the dishonorable and wicked thought, and Taryn cries out in disgust and terror, what man am I? The question is answered as he leaps into the crevice to sacrifice his own life if need be to save Craddock. It is here, in what may become their icy grave, that the dying Craddock admits to Taryn that he has lied about their kinship. Earlier this revelation would have been a great source of joy for Taryn, but now it matters little. Knowing his heart harbored such darkness, so sobered Taryn that the identity of his father seemed inconsequential. With a gentle touch, Lloyd Alexander also has offered in his stories universal truths about the human condition, such as when the bard at Dayon gently chides Taryn about his quest for glory. Is there not glory enough in living the days given to us, Adeon asks. You should know there is adventure in simply being among those we love, and the things we love, and beauty too. A few other examples from the Prydain Chronicles, words spoken by Alexander's wisest characters. We hold each other's lives in our open hands, not in clenched fists. While nothing is certain, all is possible. There are times when the seeking counts more than the finding. Nothing we do is ever done entirely alone. There is a part of us and everyone else. Take this as a gift from a crone to a maiden. And no, there is not so much difference between the two, for even a tottering granddam keeps a portion of girlish heart and the youngest maiden a thread of old woman's wisdom. Another attribute of Lloyd Alexander's writing is humor, which he often employed to offer comic relief in an otherwise tension-filled story. When trying to choose humorous passages to share with you here today, we realized how deeply embedded his humor is in the flow of his stories, making it harder to pull out a sentence or two as clear examples. Longer passages are typically necessary. However, here is an example from Alexander's final book, The Golden Dream of Carlo Ciccio, where Lloyd lightened the tense atmosphere during a council meeting of thugs and warlords. Carlo, whose life hangs in the balance, makes this humorous, true-to-life observation. Business over, I expected them to leave, but at every meeting, after all is said, done, and settled, there has to be somebody who muddies the waters by asking an intelligent question. <laughs> Alexander's humor is also evident in his observations about people and life. For example, in Janine is French, the novel about his wife's adjustments to America, he observes her stubborn tussle with the English language. Janine made English her personal possession, a toy to be played with, not taken seriously. She made the language stand on its head and do tricks. By the time she had compressed it, reversed it, squeezed, lacerated, hogtied, and branded it. It was more than tamed. It was cowed. She so far surpassed the philologists in their wildest speculations that I realized I was privileged to witness the birth of a new theory, Janine's Law. Unlike Grimm's, Janine's Law involved no logic and was constantly being amended. In general, it centered on a few basic patterns. First, the switch around, in which words such as fountain pen and milk bottle became the pen fountain and the bottle milk. This was one of the simpler aspects of Janine's law. More startling and original were Janine's views on grammar. There were no limits to the variations and changes she could ring on straightforward sentences. The past tense annoyed her. She used it reluctantly and with contempt Phrases including do, did, and so on dropped like pinches of spice into the syntactical stew. 
Thus Janine was able to concoct statements such as, did I had it? Or was I done it? A combination of the foregoing might result in a remark, didn't you had put the bottle milk empty on the porch front? <laughs> Isn't it? Then I will. Frizzing to death, that's D-E-A-F, frizzing to death was a phrase Janine acquired during our first winter, accompanying, with, accompanying it with the gesture of covering her ears with her hands. I discovered later she had understood the words to mean the weather was cold enough to make you lose your hearing. Crow and owl gave her particular difficulty. The first she pronounced to rhyme with how, the second to rhyme with whole. Poor crow, Janine said one cold afternoon when she observed a lone blackbird perched on a limb outside the window. She said it with such emphasis that to me, somehow the mispronunciation only sharpened the bird's chilly solitude. And at night, the distant sound of hooting became much more weird and strange when Janine put a finger to her lips and said, listen, a hole. It is also noteworthy that Lloyd rarely duplicated a setting in his books. Ancient Wales, ancient Greece, ancient China, the ancient Arab world, Eastern Europe, even old Philadelphia. Each book received six months of planning and preparatory research. The Iron Ring, for instance, takes place in ancient India, and he read about 50 books on Indian history, culture, and mythology. Readers and reviewers alike have pointed to the power and beauty of Alexander's prose. Their words highlight the stature of this author among his peers. He stood apart from the crowd. Here are a few examples. Zena Sutherland, a University of Chicago professor, single-handedly wrote the reviews for the greatly respected Bulletin of the Center for Children's Books. She complimented Alexander for his high narrative sense. Quote, I think there are many fantasy writers who have messages to deliver, and they let the message obscure the medium, or they become terribly concerned with playing around with words. Lloyd also has messages and plays around with words but never so it obscures his sense of narrative. He writes a cracking good story, no matter what, el what else is going on in the book. In a review of the Book of Three, British literary critic David Monaco deplores the movement toward modern fantasy as, quote, soulless, streamlined, chromium-plated, jet-propelled, close quote. But then he says, so we, at any rate, will give three rousing, reactionary cheers for Lloyd Alexander's The Book of Three. Here we have all the good old ingredients, superbly blended and baked to perfection by a master chef. The whole book is a delight, extremely funny as well as exciting. Mr. Alexander endows it with glowing Celtic gloom and mystery without making it too Welsh for foreign ears and eyes. He is to be congratulated on all counts. The British, who had worn the fantasy crown since time began, have been reluctant to acknowledge other countries' accomplishments in this field. This fact makes Monaco's praise all the more glowing. The New York Times book review has high standards. The reviewers are difficult to please. Review, reviewer Jean Fritz wrote, reading the five books of the Prudane cycle is like listening to the movements in a symphony separately over a period of time. Now, with the High King, the concluding book to the cycle, one wants to stand up and shout, bravo. Now we'd like to do a personal look at Lloyd Alexander. In 1967, the Alexanders moved a few blocks into a new house in Drexel Hill, Pennsylvania. 
a house where both Lloyd and Janine would live until their deaths. There he maintained his typical writing schedule, completing work on the Perdain books. Each morning at 3 a.m., an upstairs window in their white house on Drexel Avenue would spring to life, the soft glow bathing the trees and lawn. For those in the know, this was a signal that Lloyd Alexander had entered his office, again affectionately called the box, to begin his writing day. Long ago, Lloyd discovered that the muse visited him during these early morning hours, and so rising daily in the darkness had become a defining characteristic of his writing. The added benefit of an early schedule was the lack of distraction. No one phoned or came to the door at 3 a.m. He wrote seven days a week during his entire career, starting before dawn and continuing until seven or eight. And that routine was never interrupted unless he was out of town. Even when his child, Mado, died, he did not miss a day of writing. For him, it was a way to cope, to put order in what for him was chaos. Outside his prescribed writing time each day, Lloyd Alexander lived a simple life, and he was a wonderful, compulsive eccentric and a paradox. For instance, he kept three event calendars, although he rarely left the house. He composed on a manual typewriter, always keeping an identical machine in the attic as a spare. He wrote the first draft of his grocery shopping list on Sunday, refining it Monday and Tuesday so it was polished by the time he arrived at Fresh Supermarket each Wednesday promptly at 9 a.m. He owned three cars in his life, a used 1930 Model A Coupe, a new 1955 Chevrolet, and a new 1972 Chevy Nova. The day he died, the Nova, his only car for 35 years, still sat in his garage with just over 47,000 miles on the odometer, an average of fewer than 1,400 miles per year. Lloyd was also a firm believer in Murphy's Law. If something could go wrong, it would. He even regularly called himself a pessimist, and his friends and family understood this about him. An old friend once commented that it seemed that Lloyd always saw a hearse in the rearview mirror. <laughs> Lloyd felt the only defense against all of the awful things waiting to happen was to keep a low profile, not to be noticed. Therefore, he purposely overpaid his income taxes just so the IRS auditors would pass over his name. He kept those three event calendars to help offset the likelihood that he'd forget something important. When his friend Trina Shart Hyman, the Caldecott winning artist, illustrated Lloyd's story, The Fortune Tellers, she took the opportunity to have a little fun with his pessimistic outlook. In this scene, if you look closely to the far right, Lloyd is sitting on the veranda of a cantina, sipping his drink. Trina perched two vultures on the roof above his head. <laughs> a little lighthearted commentary on Lloyd's gloomy view of things. We experienced this pessimism firsthand once during a visit to the Alexander home. Lloyd and the two of us headed out to his car for a quick trip to pick up the weekly pizza. All the way to the garage, Lloyd kept muttering, Hope it starts. When we settled into the car, he sighed and said again, hope it starts. We asked him if the Nova had been giving him trouble. In true Lloyd fashion, he answered, no, it always starts up right away, but you never know. <laughs> it was clear that each attempt to start the car was for Lloyd a roll of the dice. Despite the low slung ceiling of gloom, Alexander genuinely saw the good in people and acted accordingly. When Zena Sutherland, a good friend and skilled literary critic from the University of Chicago, was asked to describe Lloyd's greatest trait, 
One expected the answer might be something like strong use of language or richly developed characters. However, her unhesitating reply was one word, kindness. Anne Durrell, his editor for more than three decades, recently remembered he never took himself pompously. Here's additional evidence. He never charged for a speech. He answered every letter the day it arrived, which led to some wonderful and long-term relationships with his readers. He prepared breakfast for his wife, Janine, every morning and delivered it on a tray to her bed. Lloyd knew the name of the pest exterminator, the yard man, the service station attendant, the supermarket checker, and the woman at the UPS store, and the names of their children who received autographed copies of his books. Although he had no university degrees, Lloyd was the picture of an educated man. As a teenager, he began reading four hours each day, and before his one and only semester at college, he read the entire works of Freud, Jung, and Adler in preparation for Psych 101. He knew Shakespeare and Dickens, the Lake Poets, and major writers in Europe and Asia. He worked the London Times crossword puzzle every morning in ink and allowed himself two mistakes but often had none. Always interested in music, he knew hundreds of compositions by heart and took up the violin as an adult, practicing daily and playing weekly with a small group of dedicated musicians. As for composers, Mozart was his particular favorite and his piano was crowned with a bust of the Austrian master, and a small portrait sat on his desk as a source of inspiration. As Theodore Dreiser points out, all individuals are a bundle of contradictions, none more so than the most capable. In spite of his fine tastes in literature and music, Alexander made no excuses or apologies for reading crime novels, or for frequently viewing the Teletubbies, <laughs> regularly tuning in to Deal or No Deal, and maybe best of all, watching every episode of Xenia, Xena the Warrior Princess. <laughs> and though Alexander complained bitterly about traveling to speaking engagements, he seemed to forget the pain when surrounded by his fans. It took, it took Jim and I a dozen years of coaxing to finally get him to visit BYU. He arrived grumbling, but then enjoyed the students so much that he said to them, much to our chagrin, I'm having such a wonderful time, I wish Jim and Mike had invited me sooner. <laughs> Lloyd, at one point in his life, aspired to being an artist but he admits to having lacked the necessary talent. However, he was an accomplished cartoonist. Each year he illustrated his own Christmas cards, always with his caricature holding or playing a violin in the midst of a host of anthropomorphized cats posed to represent some classical work of art. Only a true art aficionado could regularly identify the original painting. Alas, we usually failed. However, we choose to appear more astute than we are by sharing with you the only three we were able to identify. <laughs> Botticelli's <laughs> The Birth of Venus. <laughs> Lutz's Washington Crossing the Delaware. And Seurat's a Sunday afternoon on the island of La Grande Jotte. Though Lloyd Alexander had diverse interests and hobbies, the writer and the man were inseparable. In a moment of heartfelt candor, he once told us decades ago that were he given the choice of writing one more book, but then having to die, or never writing again, 
and being able to live out his natural lifespan, he would choose writing the final story. Lloyd Alexander indeed stood apart from the crowd, both in the way he lived his life and the way he wrote. There really was nothing hurried, artificial, or shallow about his living or his writing. He seemed to sum up his own life in the enchanter Dalbin's words to Ilanwi in the castle of Lear. Child, child, do you not see? For each of us comes a time when we must be more than what we are. Lloyd Alexander regularly rose to those heights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>